So that is probably one of my favorite songs I didn't know they were going to do, and I'm a complete wreck. Hopefully you guys are also, because that's a great spot to be in when God's going to do his work. Good morning. My name is Jeff Dawkins. I'm one of the deacons here at Cornerstone Church. It's my privilege to bring you the Word of God today. In your Bibles, we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to go through the first half of 2 Timothy 2, but to get there, I want to start back where we were last week. 2 Timothy is Paul's last letter. It's essentially Paul's obituary that he's writing for himself with a forward push to Timothy to carry on. This was written in 67 AD. This is the time when Nero in Rome was killing Christians. Peter wrote 1 Peter in 66 AD. And as it comes up, Paul now, by himself, left alone, is here to think about what he wants to pass on to Timothy. So that's the flavor that Pastor Doug unpacked last, last week. That's the foundation that we're going to be in. So we start every message with the question of the day. And you'll see up on the screen, the question of the day today is what does it take to live a cross-centered life in view of eternity? This series that we're in in 2 Timothy, it bridges from where we were at the cross-centered life and moves us into the summer series and pretty much through the end of the year with Daniel and Revelation and a view of eternity. So what better way to ask yourself, how do we live that out? How do we walk out God's call in our lives? If you have your Bibles, please go to 2 Timothy. That's going to be in the New Testament after Thessalonians. The T's are all together. It's about halfway through the New Testament there. And we're going to read verse 1 all the way through verse 13. So follow along with me. You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Remember Jesus Christ. Risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. It is a trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. What a wonderful passage. This passage of scripture, we're going to break it into two parts today. The two parts are going to be live, leaving a legacy and then living a legacy. So to break this down to begin with, leaving a legacy begins in verse 1. And Paul from the initial start of his ministry in the letter to the church of Galatians, he had taken a 14-year journey to become the man that God wanted him to be, to preach the message that God called him to preach. In fact, in Galatians 2.20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. And he continues, and he writes, I do not nullify the grace of God. For if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. And this same Paul continues with his legacy that Pastor Doug laid out for us last week. And in verse 8 of chapter 1 in 2 Timothy, he says, Therefore, do not be ashamed. He's telling Timothy, own it. And in verse 12, he said, For this reason I suffer these things, but I am not ashamed. And now he lands as a punctuation to the thought directed specifically at Timothy for where he's going to move to next. And he says in verse 1, and I'm going to add something here, you therefore, my son, be not ashamed as well, but rather be strong. 
In verse 2, he says, And the things that you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. He's laying out the legacy impact. Paul rightly draws on that spiritual father-son relationship that he has with Timothy. He charges Timothy with the replication of the faith that he had from his conversion on the road to Damascus and even what was witnessed back from when David charged Solomon. You'll see up on the screen the slide from 1 Chronicles 28, verse 10. It says, Consider now, if the Lord has chosen you to build the house of the sanctuary, be courageous and act. And it's not a coincidence that Pastor Doug opened up with that message in Joshua. Be strong and courageous and act. Paul then reminds Timothy and us in 1 Corinthians 11.1 1, when he says, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. He is trusting Timothy, the son that he poured into, to carry on the legacy of Jesus Christ for him. He commands him to do it because Jesus is the point. So we see how he leaves his legacy for Timothy. And we're going to take those two and put them aside, those two verses. And I want you to look again at verse 1 through a different filter. We're going to live a legacy. And the rest of our time, we're going to spend breaking down five key points about living a legacy for Christ. So if you're taking notes, you want to pay attention on these five points. Living out a legacy, as we saw, demands action. Paul is not a man who ever stayed still when God called him to work, right? He beheld God and he went. Psalm 27, 7 and 8. Don't turn there. You can make a note to check this later. It says... Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, and be gracious to me and answer me. He's calling out to God. And when you said, seek my face, my heart said, your face, O Lord, I shall seek. You see, even the psalmist knew that there is action that follows prayer. Action follows God's call in your heart. And we're looking at how Paul uses 13 short verses, which is really a couple breaths in a sentence for him to chart a course to the action that he wanted Timothy to take. Now, Scripture does a lot of cool stuff. And if you spend any time with the Word of God, which here at Cornerstone, we love you to do every single day, every single way, right? That's the soapbox that I get to carry on from Pastor Doug. We know that God's Word changes you. And when you look at God's Word, sometimes it smacks you. And sometimes it helps you. And sometimes it picks you off the ground. What Paul's going to use here, his writing style, he's going to use five different imperatives. And imperatives are commands. Paul is going to give Timothy commands. You see, for a man who's at his last days, and he knows his time has come, chained to a wall, he has urgency and intensity. I want you to think of a picture of, of a generator humming. This is that man. The generator's humming. He knows his time's coming, but he knows the generator is about to go and fill the world. He's commanding Timothy with an intense desire to do as he did. Because Paul's journey first in himself, because remember, he was a Pharisee named Saul, and he was a pretty good Pharisee. And by his own estimation, he was the Pharisee of Pharisees. And he really stepped up his life to become the Apostle Paul that led him to this. As Paul, chained to a wall in a stone prison, considers what to write to his son Timothy, we're going to see how he opens with his first imperative in verse 1. Strength. Verse 1 reads, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now the command to be strong here, the imperative, is synonymous with establishing or confirming or to make stable. Paul is setting the table that he laid out in chapter 1. He doesn't leave Timothy guessing. He tells him, he confirms that strength will come only through the grace found in Christ Jesus. Grace, as Paul knows, is the undeserved favor brought to a man that does not deserve it. It's the grace that Paul commands Timothy to anchor himself as he's leaving Timothy. And Timothy knows his mentor is not going to be by his side again. So he tells him, be strong. And then he moves to the second imperative of trust. Listen to what he says in verse 2. The things which you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. 
See, Paul understands that you have to have strength, not in yourself, but in Christ Jesus first. Because once you know whose you are, you can tie into the mission. He is going to help Timothy understand how to bring that message out to a lost and dying world. Remember, how does Paul know in his jail cell that one generation from now, the name Jesus Christ will be erased from the earth? He doesn't know. He's begging Timothy, entrust this to other men, faithful men, that will bring forth my message. He cites Timothy as a faithful man in the first chapter in verse 5 as having a sincere faith. Remember, it was entrusted to him, that sincere faith from his grandmother to his mother. And then Timothy as a pastor at the church at Ephesus is able to teach others also. And maybe he's remembering what he wrote about Timothy to the church at Philippi in Philippians. And again, make a note, you don't need to turn there, but listen to what he writes in Philippians 2, 19 through 22. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may be encouraged when I learn your condition. Listen to what he says. For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. For they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus, but you know of his proven worth that he served with me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father. Paul's second command to Timothy is simply to trust that God's going to bring him the distance in God's strength. Certainly not Timothy's strength. Paul knows that the strongest place he can be is in the hands of living God. So our first point talks about being strong, right? And we move on this pathway, we're going to the cross of entrusting this to faithful men. His third imperative is suffering. Now this takes a different approach in verses 3 through 6. So you can follow along with me as I read verses 3 through 6. Suffer hardship with me. He's saying, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. And if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the cross. And the Greek translated of that suffer means suffer, get this, together with someone. Paul is not leaving this to chance. He knows the man that God called him to be. He's telling Timothy to, man, to be the man that God called him to be. Suffer together with me, Timothy. Paul's personal journey reflects more hardship and more suffering than any character in the New Testament outside of Christ. Paul's going to use three culturally appropriate references. He uses the soldier in the time of Nero, right? He uses an athlete to show physical prowess. He uses a farmer in a society that relies completely on farmers. But he's not making the point there. He's using them as the cultural analogy to illustrate to Timothy the connection on how even though he's going to be gone, Timothy understands he can endure suffering because guess what? Jesus is with him. When we talk about Paul. Think of the life of this man from 2 Corinthians 12. Let me just read some stuff here from 2 Corinthians 12. And if you want to make a reference, it's going to be from 21 to 30. Paul is the man who was lashed, beaten, stoned, shipwrecked, lost at sea, constantly in fear of his life everywhere he went, sleep deprived, hungry, thirsty, cold, and on top of this, carrying the weighty pressure of the churches he started, the people he commissioned, and the God he loved. And as Pastor Doug brought out last week, if you are encouraging someone, you tell them to run from that. You don't tell them to follow you. I work as a police officer. I don't tell my people, go run into danger and get hurt. And what does Paul tell him? He says, you're going to go. Because he remembers the truth that he started telling the Roman people in Romans 5. Not only this, the slide will show, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God who's been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who was given to us, is present. That's why Paul tells Timothy, suffer. Be strong, trust the message, and suffer, brother. Because of his suffering, Paul has been assured that his hope in Christ is the Holy Spirit. This is his motivation to command Timothy to suffer. 
So in six verses, and again, like I said, really, as you talk through it, just one breath for Paul, he gives Timothy three really hard commands, right? So now in his fourth imperative, his fourth command, he takes a breath now, and he's going to give Timothy a chance to catch his breath and reflect. The fourth imperative is reflection, and it's going to be in verse 7. Follow along. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And just as Paul slows down his emphatic pacing, so will I. I'll stop yelling at you guys. He's asking Timothy to take a minute and reflect. Consider. Consider the truth of what's going on. Consider what a life lived for Jesus Christ is going to cost. Consider it, Timothy. You watched me, brother, my whole life. Consider it. It's a consideration commanded with the integrity and the focus of a man who knows he's going to die and had considered this. There's a quote that's going to come up, and I love this quote, and I think about it often, and it reads, I shall preach Jesus as if I shall never preach Jesus again. I shall preach Jesus as if I were a dying man preaching to other dying men. What if? What if? What if in the moment today for us, we could preach Jesus as if we were a dying man to other people who are dying? Because guess what they are? And when I hear gospel moments and I hear stories and I hear a life from like a Rob Reed who stops at a QT to get something and brings three homeless guys to church. That's a man who understands he was dying. And he's going to other dying man preaching Jesus because he understands it. The foundation in Jesus Christ is the trust in him alone. And Paul knows it's going to cost Timothy dearly. He knows it. He's asking him. He's commanding him. Suffer with me, Timothy, but preach the kingdom of God. Timothy's going to read this last letter. And honestly, Paul has already been killed by the time Timothy gets this letter. And he's got to really reflect back what message did the last important thing my mentor have to say bring to me. And in Timothy, then he exhales, right, with this moment of reflection on the way the word's written that he is feeling in his heart. His eyes continue to read. He inhales with the source of Paul's joy. He knows the why. He knows the why of what's written. He knows what's coming. Because after stripping away all the fear for Timothy to encourage him, Paul delivers the key to the entire chapter. And I'm going to tell you, if you're taking notes, make a note of this point right here. This is the key of the entire letter of 2 Timothy. It's our fifth imperative. It's affirmation of adoration. Follow along with me as I read verses 8 through 13. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal. But the word of God is not in prison. For this reason I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen, that they may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. For it's a trustworthy statement. For if we died with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure... We shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. We talked last week again about how no one on earth has done more for the spread of the gospel, for faith in Jesus than Paul, and no one built into Timothy more than Paul. But the mission, people, you got to get this, the mission of Jesus Christ, the why, is always what mattered more to Paul. As much as he loved the churches and Timothy, he remembers Jesus Christ. Paul's love for Jesus Christ, his Lord, his Savior, and his purpose, it's what consumed him. It's what chained him to a wall alone with joy. Timothy had been trained the same way, and Paul, again, at the end of his life, brings it back to the gospel. He says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. And I can see Paul grabbing Timothy. If he were in the cell, he's grabbed my shoulder and saying, listen, remember Jesus. You're young, remember Jesus. They made fun of you, remember Jesus. You're not good enough. Remember Jesus Christ. Oh, in case you're wondering where he came from, descendant of King David. That's my gospel. Timothy, that's your power. Paul contextualizes this he affirms to Timothy about an unwavering faith. Verses 9 and 10 
talk about suffering that hardship and all the hardships that Paul went through that we talked about in 2 Corinthians 12, he ends up again in prison. And for Paul, it wasn't the first time. But get this, Paul knows it's the last time. He's in prison by himself. And he reminds Timothy, the word of God is never in prison. So Pastor Doug talked about this before, and I'm going to bring this out. By the standard we have today, the church is losing. That's hard to hear, right? Because we all sit here together. I'm telling you, the church is losing by the world's standards. The world says, you're not good enough. Christians can be killed. We can kill unborn babies to the moment of birth. But the word of God's never in prison. Christians are made to be the enemy in our own country. We're living in a time, people, that we think is unique to us. This is Paul's time. Paul understood what it was like to think about never hearing Jesus again ever. He knows he's going to die. He's begging Timothy. Carry forth this message, brother. How can you remember Jesus? Kids, when you're in school, how do you remember Jesus when they mock you? Guys, when you're at work and you want to say something for Christ, but you're afraid and you know people are going to make fun of you. When you're told by your supervisor as a police officer, if you mention that again, you're being written up and you say, here's a hundred write-ups, I'm going to be busy today. True story. Amen. But seriously, when you're alone with yourself and you don't know if tomorrow makes you good enough because of your bank account or because of the clothes you wear or your little perfect Stepford kids that we think are pre-made Christians and they're not and we think we're failing as parents, guess what? Jesus Christ. Guess what? Remember Jesus Christ. Guess what? Like the man of God that Paul was, you remember Jesus Christ. And on your knees humbly in prayer, you thank God that he gave us Jesus Christ. Amen. Everyone Everyone deserted Paul. Everyone deserted Jesus. Everyone. I ask you, if you haven't felt this way recently, if you haven't felt that attack, if you haven't felt uncomfortable, if you're sitting here today and you know you get to go home and plan what's coming up next week for Mother's Day, I'm going to ask you to think about that. I'm going to ask you to think about that accountability because if you remember Jesus Christ, that mission goes from here to here and then from here you walk it out and you meet people. There's someone here I met four days ago and by the grace of God connected our lives and I said, bro, you need to remember Jesus Christ. Come to church. He said, okay. <laughs> Is that easy? Yeah, guess what? We don't do anything. We bring people to the throne of grace and God's spirit does it all. Can you remember Jesus Christ? All right. I got to land the plane here, as Chad would say. Back to the text in verse 10. <laughs> verse 10, for this reason I endure all things. So what reason is Paul talking about? He again bounces back. Not for what he just said. He bounces back to remember Jesus Christ. That's the reason for everything. Absolute love of the person, the man, the mission of Jesus is the force that Timothy needs. It allows him to do anything and everything for Jesus. It gives Timothy a chance to tell people about salvation and why it's the only thing that matters. Verse 11 through 13, where it begins, it's a trustworthy statement. Well, Paul in three verses goes on to cement the foundation of why he lived the life he lived since his conversion on the road to Damascus. Then people, he's finishing setting up Timothy's armor, right? He tells him, let's walk through this. Be strong, trust, suffer, consider, affirm and adore. He's setting in place Timothy's armor because he knows that what's coming are the attacks. And that it's critical that the essential piece he has is to preach Jesus Christ. Continue the mission. So we're going to do something and you're going to trust me because you love me. I want you to close your eyes. And because I can see all of you, I can see when your eyes are open. You need to close your eyes, everyone, and listen. Close your eyes and just listen. And in your mind, as I speak, you think of the picture that comes to mind when I read what Paul wrote to Timothy, because this is what Timothy was doing. As he cried, he was thinking these things. Die with him, 
and to live with him because that's my Jesus reaching out while hanging on my cross. To endure with him and to reign with him. It's Jesus' hand on my shoulder as we kneel praying for yet another way and knowing, knowing that God's going to come through. Denying him, he denies us. And the tears in my eyes can't match the one in his as he said, I never knew you. We're faithless, but Jesus is faithful as God. And if I fall away from him again and again and again, he reaches down and picks up my face and pulls my eyes to him. And he smiles. Open your eyes. Paul left it all on the table, chained to a wall, no one around. Honestly, not even with the table. So I ask you, what does the world need? Does the world need more gifted men that are outwardly empowered? Or does the world need broken men who are inwardly transformed? Man, I had this written weeks ago, and I didn't know Eric. I didn't know Brian would come up here and talk about broken men that are the power of Jesus Christ that transforms lives and families and generations. Remember Jesus Christ. So as we wrap it up, we understand that Paul's five commands, those imperatives, they carry out the conversation. They carry out the last energy, the last breath of a man who knows he's going to die. And what would you say to that man in that moment? He stripped away everything. He stripped away everything in Paul's life when he gave him everything. In your bulletins, you guys have crosses. So take out the cross. So you understand another cool way about how, how awesome God is. The verse on the cross we had cut out about ah, three weeks ago, not knowing what Pastor Doug's invocation was going to be. True story. Raise the cross up. Raise your eyes to the cross. Look at the cross you're looking at for a second. Read the words. Be strong. Raise your cross up. You can see what I see. I see crosses. And all you can see are crosses. And we can see Jesus. Is today the day? Is today the day that your spouse hears from you the message of Jesus? Keep the crosses up. There you go. Show some intensity. Do your kids get to understand that Jesus matters to you today as you hold high the gospel? Do your friends, do your coworkers, do the people around you, do your neighbors, do people know you're a Christian? Do you know you're a Christian? Because I'm telling you, if you don't, time is short. Time is short. What's stopping you? You put your crosses down. What's stopping you? What is stopping you today from telling somebody? Are you afraid? Paul was killed got up, went back in the same city with the same message. Are you scared? Paul's chained to a wall alone, and it was dark. I don't like the dark. Are you worried about your safety? Remember Jesus Christ, because in that moment, nothing matters. And if you've done this ever in your whole life, you know what I'm talking about. The moment you talk to somebody and they say, well, sure, I'll listen to what you have to say, and you think, God's real. Tomorrow's promise to no one. Tomorrow's promise to no one. What are you doing today? Briefly, let me tell you a quick story. I was on the range doing some firearms training, and I threw a bullet into a box, and the bullet exploded. True story. Surprised me, especially when the shrapnel hit me in the face, and the bullet hit me in the knee, I fall to the ground and go like this, I see blood, and I hear people say around me, oh my gosh, he's been shot in the head. True story. And another person said, there's no exit wound. So anybody that knows that, I'm, I'm listening to this in about three seconds, I think. Okay, I've, been sh I've literally been shot in the head through my throat. I came out, and when I exhale, I'm going to exhale blood, and I'm going to die. And then I thought, I get to go meet Jesus on the ranch. And I don't say that jokingly because when I sat up, everybody went, wah! They thought I had died. And then I got mad, of course, and did the total Jeff thing. Let's go, reload, let's get back in the game. They're like, no. 
So I sat down, firefighters showed up, cops showed up, what's going on? And I was more on fire for Jesus. I said, do you realize what happened? Jesus Christ saved me. And they're like, okay. I'm like, no, 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 firefighter guy, what's your name? Billy. Billy, listen to me. Jesus Christ saved me. He can save you too. He's like, yeah, right, put your head back. You are no more on fire for the Lord when you realize possibly that you're going to meet him. That's truth. So let me summarize. You'll see it up on the screen. In God's strength, trust him and follow through suffering that will come, reflecting on renewed faith and purpose to adore Jesus as he affirms his call in you. So really, back to our question of the day, what does it take to live a cross-centered life in view of eternity? How about this? How about remembering God's purpose? How about remembering God's path for you, for me? How about seeing for Paul that Jesus Christ was his life, for Timothy that Jesus was his hope and guide, and for us as believers, Jesus Christ is our salvation, and it changes everything. Jesus Christ changes everything. Later on after service, you guys have an opportunity to talk about some of these things. In the back of your notes, there's some table talk questions. I won't read them. Guys, talk about these things on the way home, afterwards, together, throughout the week. And I challenge you to do the readings and remember what a life for Christ is like. And please, if you hear nothing else today, hear these three words. Remember Jesus Christ. Talk to me. Talk to one of the elders. Talk to a deacon. Talk to anyone here that has that changing story about what their life was like and what their life is like now. Talk to us because we'll tell you because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But Jesus Christ does. Let's pray. Father God, in this moment, what a great reminder that if we say, remember Jesus Christ a hundred times, it's still a hundred times too little. And if we say we have it, Lord, we know we don't have it. And if we are encouraged in anything, it's the fact that you put examples in your living word in the Bible of men like Paul and men like Timothy. And I thank you for that. And I thank you for where you're going to take us the rest of the day, Lord, because faith with you, through you, and to you matters. In Jesus' name. Amen.